What's up, queens? Welcome to the Female Dating Strategy Podcast, the meanest female-only podcast on the internet. I'm Ro. I'm Savannah. And I'm Lilith. And today, this episode is going to be on double standards between men and women. This might be controversial, but personally, I think FDS was built upon this principle as well. We are not interested in being equal or, in quotation marks, fair with men. The problem is when a disadvantaged group tries to be equal and fair to the dominant group, they are only further disadvantaging themselves. This is the reason why in the UK we have things like the positive action. Now, what positive action is, it's a provision in the Equality Act of 2010 that allows uh, companies and organisations to adopt initiatives that advance the interest and progression of a disadvantaged group. So let's say you have a recruitment campaign and you have a white candidate who scores exactly the same as a black candidate. Under UK law, it's perfectly legal for, you know, for the organisation to hire the black candidate under positive action. It's not the same as positive discrimination because, I mean, for it to be positive action, the organisation or company needs to prove that that particular group, so for example, black people or women, they are at a disadvantage in the workforce. So similarly speaking, All of these are technically not double standards, you know, what we're going to go through. It's more positive action because every metric shows that women are at a disadvantage in society and are at an even bigger disadvantage when they choose to have relationships with men. Yeah, I find in general, in feminist discussions, whenever you say that the goal is equality with men and you try to address any kind of existing inequality, the guys on Twitter and shit, they're always like, well, what if the genders were reversed or what if the roles were swapped or whatever? I don't care. Yeah, like, oh, that's sexist against men. Thinking that men are more likely to be rapists is sexist against men. That's discrimination. Like, it's not, it's discrimination to not let me, you know, have this or that job where I have access to vulnerable minor girls and stuff or whatever, right? I don't give a shit. Like, (laughs) this is the thing. Like, stop caring. Exactly. Like, I mean, I want to be clear. I personally, I, Lilith, am a female supremacist. That does not represent the views of all of FDS. FDS, we are about prioritizing women and maximizing female benefit. I take it to the next level with female supremacy. I think that women are inherently just cognitively better than men. I think we're actually just better and that superiority needs to be taken into account when you're interacting with men. And plus, you know, the usual like men are more violent, more prone to violent outbursts and stuff like that. So for example, I think it's okay for women to use emotional manipulation on men to keep ourselves safe. But when men use emotional manipulation on women, that's unethical. That's just like (laughs) about putting yourself first, right? So that's double standard. One little freebie double standard I just threw out there. (laughs) And women also have to remember, like, especially the equality feminists in quotation marks, it's like men are not interested in being equal with women. As much as they like to say that as a gotcha, they're not interested. They want to maintain the status quo and the social order that says men are better and are more advantaged than women. So remember that. This is why I'm just like, I've stopped caring when men are like, it's not fair to men. I'm like, so what? It's not been fair to women for centuries. And the reason why things are now unfair in quotation marks to men is because of the system that they've set up and the fact that women are now saying no and rebelling against it and actually taking their own interests into account for that. It's not even unfair. It's, it's more fair. It's just not them unilaterally having control anymore. And they still have a lot of control. Exactly. So it's just them you know, reacting to the fact that they can't get women based on oppression anymore or not oppression to the extent of their forefathers because they're still, women are still oppressed in some respects. Agreed. So I wanted to make a point about double standards as well. Like people think that they are universally a bad thing and I disagree with that. So an example I will use is it wouldn't be reasonable or make sense for me to shut down like, you know, Westfield shopping center for me to go shopping because I'm not a celebrity who gets hounded every time I step outside my house. That would be disproportionate, but it would make sense for a big celebrity. I don't know who's a big celebrity off the top of my head, but it would make more sense for them to do that because there's a possibility that they would get hounded or potentially harmed. So double standards exist in society and some of them are for very, very good reason. So don't like let the term double standard put you off because some double standards should exist because there's a reason for them to exist as we'll go through in this episode. I think all of these double standards in this episode are perfectly justified, by the way. I might be biased, but I hope you agree by the end of it. So let's kick off with like an FDS classic. What's the one that that always gets us in trouble, ladies? 
I think the one that men should pay for dates all the time, even if the woman asks him out, he should still pay for it. Yeah. So this is one that gets us in trouble both with men and with feminists, hilariously enough, because the feminists are like, no, like, you know, equality, like women should take turns paying for dates, you know. Or I don't want to feel like I owe him sex at the end of it, like whatever. Yeah. I mean, first of all, you don't owe him sex at the end of it. And the fact that you feel like you owe him sex if he pays for your date, it's like, maybe question why you feel that way, sis. That's on you. That's something you need to work through if you really care about feminism. No, to be fair, it's because men do act entitled. They go online and they rage, but they also start to pressure women in real life situations. So a lot of women feel like, okay, I don't want to do anything that's going to cause the man to pressure me into sex later. And they equate that with allowing a man to pay for dates for them. The problem with that is, is that like men will use any excuse out there possible to justify why they're entitled to sex. They're still going to try to fuck you, sis, even if you pay. Exactly. You know, they're still going to find something else to manipulate. That's what I'm saying. So what's happening is we're losing ground. We're losing ground because we're allowing men to assert that they're entitled to sex if they pay and we don't push back on that. And we don't like assert to them that like, no, they're not entitled to sex just because they pay and also walk away from the situation when we start to get uncomfortable. So the idea is that in this particular situation, it's okay to apply the double standards because quite frankly, women are much more of a disadvantage every time we go on a date with men, both in terms of like risk. And this is like old school Canon FDS, right? Both in terms of just like overall safety risk, as well as like the amount of prior grooming we have to do to put into women make less money. Yeah. As well as the opportunity cost versus men, right? So it's not even really that it's a that they're losing anything is more like they're balancing the risk between men and women by actually paying for the date. So I think the idea is that for us is when we have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable or getting more comfortable with telling men to fuck off once they start asserting that they're entitled to sex for any given reason. Like just the payment thing is just one of many excuses, but like what keeps happening in the culture is the bar keeps getting lower because women start to feel like cowed into acquiescing to men's demands when it's like, it's better to prevent them, make sure that they're the type of guy that's comfortable with paying rather than wasting your time going on a date with them in the first place, and then sitting there in this like high pressure sales scenario that they're trying to put on you because they uh, had messed up expectations in the first place. Yeah, exactly. Like I liked what you said about how it's like seeding ground. It's like losing ground because ladies, we've got to have a counterattack. Like, you know, we need to regain this lost ground. Like I know this can be really hard for women to wrap their mind around, but like there are going to be times where you go on a date and he pays for it. And he's going to act entitled to sex, whether he pays for it or not, right? But if you go into the date with the attitude like, oh, if he pays for it, then I owe him something. Men will latch on to anything. If they are trying to manipulate unisex, they will latch on to anything. Yeah, it could be even the fact that you said yes, as in like, agree to meet him, yeah. Exactly. So like, here's the thing, like men can sniff out vulnerabilities and weaknesses, like predatory men, especially they are very good at sniffing out vulnerabilities and weaknesses. If you go into that date with this sort of like sheepish kind of like attitude, like, Oh, I don't know if I pay for it, then I may owe him something like he will sense that. And that's exactly what he's going to latch onto. So what you need to do is mentally strengthen yourself. You need to go. (laughs) It's kind of crazy. Like, (laughs) the early phases of dating with the man that you don't know that well, it's like preparing for battle. Like you gotta go into there preparing a sort of like mental. Honestly, that's why a lot of women get tired. You know, mental fortitude. Like if the guy pays for it and starts acting entitled to sex, you just gotta laugh in his face and it's gonna feel scary. And honestly, I might actually get murdered someday by a guy after laughing in his (laughs) face. (laughs) Like, (laughs) yeah. But trust me, I haven't been murdered yet. And most of the time, the guy's just like taken aback and like embarrassed or whatever. So I do this all the time and I've never been in danger. So I mean, I highly recommend ladies try it. <laughs> you got to build up your audacity reserve so you can be on Lilith's level. You just be like, get yeah, on my you level. Gotta build, <laughs> get on my level of audacity. More women need to have audacity. Okay. So let's say you're actually legitimately scared for your safety. You can pay, but then you know never to see that person again, Yeah, period. That's the thing. If you're genuinely scared for your safety, if you think that him paying for the date would genuinely put you in danger, why the fuck are you going on a date with this guy? Like, never see him again, if that's the sense that you get. Yeah. Okay, so this is my uh, Savannah's double standard. So this one is, I don't see uh, body counts on men. I hate that term, body count. Is there a better word to use? Or the number of sexual partners somebody has had. That's a more PC way to say it. 
in men and women the same. So I don't take into account a woman's a number of sexual partners at all, but I absolutely consider the number of sexual partners that a man has had and make judgments accordingly. This is because, you know, first of all, a woman who has has had a high number of sexual partners, statistically speaking, a good number of those were likely she was either coerced, um, she could have been trafficked, and basically she didn't consent to it. But when we look at a man's um, number of sexual partners, like given the prevalence of sexual violence in society that is commonly perpetrated by men, I just don't believe a man with a high body count, so to speak, that every single sexual interaction that he's had has been entirely consensual or free from coercion or deception, meaning that, you know, it could potentially range from outright rape, which some men have actually admitted to me before, like men I've been dating before, or it can be that deception where they use, you know, sex or they dangle the promise of a relationship to the woman and just extract as much sex as they can from her, which is still deceptive in my book. So that's why I don't see them in the same way. And I haven't actually met a guy who is promiscuous, who has a healthy attitude towards women and sex. I just haven't met them. And I'm not talking about like the 30-ish. I'm talking like triple digits, like mid triple digits, something that is extremely high. I haven't met a healthy, well-adjusted male with that body count who has a healthy attitude. Yeah, so that's another thing I completely agree with, Savannah. I think that the higher a man's body count, the more likely it is that he's a rapist, or at the very least, a gray rapist. You know, things like where he's like, yeah, pressured women, or, you know, pretended to be in love with her just to get sex and then bounce. Like, you know, all the the classic, like, shitty male tactics that they use to to get in a woman's pants, right? If I'm being honest, like up until I found FDS, probably like 40 to 50% of all the times that I had sex with a man was like a traumatic experience or, you know, something that I was either manipulated into either like it was traumatic before, during or after <laughs> the sexual experience, you know, even if the sex itself was good, like the way he treated me after and so on made me feel like really shitty, right? And so I don't blame women who have a higher body count because yeah, like a lot of times that women have sexual contact, I should say, is rape or, you know, sexual abuse or coerced or manipulated out of them. Or just straight up not enjoyable for them as well. Like Or it's just not enjoyable, exactly. Like, yeah, men have to put a lot more effort to get sex. And so the fact that if a man has a really high body count, it means he's spending a lot of time and effort on getting sex, which is time that he could have been spent doing other things like self improvement and stuff. So it's basically a lot of time basically uh, manipulating women, like let's be real, especially if he's having a lot of sex. Exactly. Like they're highly experienced at manipulating women. Yeah. Whereas a woman with a high body count, she's just a woman who's been probably manipulated a lot and I wouldn't blame her for that. Let me reiterate that because there are guys that I know that have high body counts that are extremely mid. And so... It's interesting because there's always this perception that every guy that has a high body count is like this alpha chad, like (laughs) the women's panties just drop in their presence. And that's just not true. There's a lot of these like mid guys who are just extremely, extremely good at manipulation. And charming. Yeah. Or they're pussy scavengers, meaning like they deliberately look for vulnerable women or they pay for it or they're uh, the type of guys that frequent prostitutes. So... In that case, it's like, it's usually indicative of their type of personality. Like, there's no way that every woman that they're manipulating into bed is a woman that, like, is all the way there, right? Like, you get to the point where with some guys, they're very, very skilled at manipulating vulnerable women, but they're not actually, uh, but they're not actually attractive in any type of way, which I think is a big gap in the understanding between, and actually to double back on that point, like, that's what a lot of the red pill tactics were for a very long time. They sort of lost their effectiveness, uh, thank God, because of things like FDS. But for a long time, it was just about how to like, quote unquote, game or manipulate women into bed. Most of these guys were extremely, extremely mid. And most of their tactics were just emotional abuse and figuring out how to pick the weak girls off from the pack, right? The girls that were lonely, the girls that were like separated from their friends. Girls with quote unquote daddy issues. Yeah. Daddy issues, like how to triangulate women who are groomed or primed for that due to traumatic backgrounds. It's literally teaching these extremely mid guys to recognize and pick the weakest women from the pack to have sex. And so it worked, quote unquote, for a certain number of men, which is why it 
took off because they realized like, oh, this is successful and this can be successful in a way, but it's obviously highly unethical. So when we talk about the guys with high body counts and they don't look, I mean, they don't look like a, a professional athlete or a model or somebody they're, like if they're not like a legitimately high status guy that women are going to every day throw themselves at the guy. Mm. Um, and even then that comes with its own. There's the guys that are at that level where they're either extremely, extremely attractive or they're like extremely, extremely wealthy or something like that. They're pro athlete level. That's like one level. And then there's a bunch of these mid guys that like constantly have sex, but it's a different situation. They're, they're, they're almost like a, the equivalent of a cult leader, which is quite different. So I think recognizing that and understanding that like the way a man sexually interacts with women and since the vast majority of men that you meet are mid, if he has a lot of a high body count, it's, it's an extreme red flag that he has some of these other behaviors. I want to just differentiate between the mid guys with a high body count versus like the mid guys who women are attracted to, but they end up in relationships with those women, right? Like they end up in long-term because so much of their lifespan is spent in like long-term committed relationships. Their body count might not be as high, but they're still very successful with women because, you know, women like them, they're friendly, charming, and so on, right? We're talking about the mid guys that are like, yeah, they don't get any repeat customers because they manipulate women into sex. That's traumatic. And then they have to start at square one every single time they're looking for sex. Yeah, those guys are being thrown back in the pool. Yeah. <laughs> That's part of why their body counts out. That's actually really interesting because like, when I was like dating around, I often, when I was in my naive stages, I never saw guys who had a lot of casual sex that way. I sort of almost saw it through like the red pill lens that they must, it must mean that they're more desirable. But looking back, these men that I was talking to, they would drop little hints that they were basically being thrown back into the pool. So they'll say something like, oh, oh, we just, you know, for example, stop talking. And I'm just thinking if you're out, I mean, surely like a general like concept of business is that it's easier to re- Retain new customers than it is to attract new business, right? So if a guy is just out for sex with a woman, right? Why would they just randomly, you know, quit talking to each other and it be a mutual thing? What likely happened is that she ghosted him. Yeah, she realized he's for the streets. Yeah, she ghosted him, but they'll frame it as, oh, we just stopped talking. Or he's one of those guys where, you know, the whole post, he chases a woman and then they have sex with her and loses interest. But here's the thing though, like, I mean, these men, they'd say I had sex with her like a few times. So I'm thinking you clearly wanted like a stable fuck buddy, but she ghosted you. Yeah. Or like he wasn't providing her with emotional needs or wasn't good in bed or whatever. Yeah. And it could be mutual there. I mean, I think most of them are actually being thrown back in the pool because the sex is very rapey. And one-sided often. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Especially if they're extra mid. That's the scary thing because I feel like the mid guys are the most dangerous because you expect the more attractive men to have more options and you're a little bit more on guard. I think the mid guys are very, very good at getting women's guards down because you don't think of them as a threat because you're like, this mid as fuck guy couldn't possibly be (laughs) (laughs) a (laughs) skirt. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then when like you have sex with him and then you realize like, oh no, he's absolutely like everything about him is very superficial and the charm that he put on before we had sex or before you know, we were interacting, it's just like for the sole purpose of sex, because he has, usually it's a, a massive ego problem, like some kind of hole that he needs to fill by manipulating women and getting more narcissistic supply. It's usually those guys who, you know, depending on what kind of narcissist they are, they're like massively insecure. So like they have to keep getting women and actively on purpose, disrespecting said women, because they're trying to prove their so-called dominance, or they're just instead of being insecure, they're just sociopaths. Like there's the other type of narcissist that it's just about like the duper's delight kind of thing where they enjoy that. And it's not them trying to fill a hole so much as like they enjoy the chase and they enjoy the, they're, they're sadists. They enjoy like disrespecting women and making them feel bad. So yeah, like I think you just have to watch out for that. Yeah. Hey, so another double standard. Bro, did you have a not doing physical labor one? Oh, hell yeah. This is my... Biggest double standard. I don't do physical labor. So, and I don't care. Cause I'm like, if you're bigger than me and it's going to take you a fraction of the time, it just makes more sense for the man to do it. I agree completely. Men exist to, <laughs> men exist to do the brute force, like labor. Yeah. The heavy lifting for women. I can do, I can lift and I can do the heavy lifting. But for me, I just enjoy the sort of power dynamic of getting a guy to do that for me. Like, even though I can do it, I just like to delegate that task. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, in fact, it kills my sexual attraction to a man if he lets me do physical labor. And I'm like, are you just going to sit on your ass and watch me do that? I don't know what that is, but there's something inside of me that just like flames up. It becomes enraged when like a man lets me do, lets me struggle with something. 
that I know he could do very, very easily physically. Right. I'm not saying push me out of the way and like be a jerk about it. But at the same time, if I'm trying to reach something on a shelf and maybe it's because I had a boyfriend that did this, like he was very, very tall. So he was like a foot taller than me. And so there's times where like I was really trying to reach something and I felt like he would just stand there and watch me on purpose. Like, <laughs> watch me try to reach it. And then at some point it just felt embarrassing. Like, okay, so you're going to watch me struggle that you're a lot taller than me. Why don't you just like, you know, extend your big long hands up there and grab it for me. And so I feel like it's a red flag when a man watches you struggle, especially if they, you know, unless you're dating a guy who's like, like shorter than you maybe. But for the most part, if you're dating men and they're taller than you and they don't automatically instinctively do physical labor for you, I think that's a red flag. And I'm totally fine with that double standard. I'm not going to doing physical labor for him. But if he lets me do physical labor without jumping in. Honestly, I think it's hot as fuck when men do manual labor, though. Yes, exactly. Win win. <laughs> like one of the things I like about my boyfriend is that he knows basic carpentry and stuff. I didn't know this about him before, like before we started dating. And then when I found out that he knew how to do basic carpentry, that was like an immediate turn on. And so sometimes I'll just be like, oh my gosh, like something's broken in my house. Like, can you come over? It's like, I don't even have to say that it's broken. I'll just like, if like I'm opening or closing a door and it's not closing properly or it's like slightly off center, he'll be like, oh, hold on. Let me go get my toolbox and like rejig the hinges and shut, uh, rejig all the hinges and shit. And I'm just like, sploosh. That's just so fucking hot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hold on. Let me fix your doorknob. It's not closing properly. I'm like, oh my God, that's like the hottest thing ever. <laughs> I agree. So like watching a man perform manual labor, fix things for you is actually a turn on. And a man who does not do that is an automatic turn off. And like I said, any man who has let me do it, it's usually like a power and control thing. They enjoy watching you struggle. Yeah. Struggle. I'm like, you see me up here trying to reach the top shelf like a child. Like, why are you sitting here just watching? I feel like they want me to feel infantile in that moment. Like if he doesn't automatically jump off of his ass... He better jump off his fucking ass and like, you know, (laughs) he better be begging to help you or like, you know, insisting on helping because if he's, yeah, that's so bizarre to watch you struggle like that. Like it is gross. I feel like they do it to make you feel infantile, to make you feel less than in that moment. Or to like remind you of your own physical inferiority. It feels like a power move. That's what it feels like to me. Absolutely. And it's not even just about physical labor as well. If he has like a skill that, you know, you're deficient in, and you need help with, and he doesn't help you, yeah, that's great. So oftentimes I've used orbiters as like translators for me when I just didn't want to use Google. And I actually found that was a really good test as well, because obviously, you know, a scrot, like I was dating a guy and he would just say, yeah, just Google translate it. But the other guys would always be like, do you want me to translate it for you? And I'm like, yes, please. And they love that. They love feeling useful. If I said thank you as well, they would do like a little emoji smile and that was it. You can tell men don't get thanked very often as well. So use that to your advantage, ladies. <laughs> They're not told they're useful very often. <laughs> yeah, and again, rad femmes would be... The feminist Twitter would be like, it's probably going to be super pissed at us for being like, oh my gosh, you're reinforcing traditional gender roles. And it's like... I don't care. At this point, I don't care. Yeah, I don't give a shit. I want to sit up on my throne as the queen, you know, like an empress observing her kingdom, you know. And also, why should I apologize if people are making my life easier? Like, that's just like saying, like, you know, the person who invented the car has, you know, set back civilization because we've all become lazier, which, yes, is true. But on the whole, he's made everybody's lives easier. So, like, why would I be sorry for that? Like, men exist to do manual labor for us, and I will not apologize for that. (laughs) They exist to help women. You're not a real feminist unless you're a struggle mule constantly working and doing everything yourself. (laughs) Struggle mule. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I am not here for the feminism that pretends sex differences don't exist because it's just highly delusional. And once again, most of the time when we're talking about gender neutrality, it's being weaponized against women in order to exploit us or take advantage of us or teach us to uh, swallow our pain or teach us or have us not pay attention while they're implementing policies that don't benefit us. So I feel like in order to create your best strategy, you have to be honest about when sex differences matter and when they don't. And this is especially true when you're looking at like a working class versus like uh, a white collar divide. A lot of times it's an interesting thing because there's a lot of times some women who are white collar workers that are like, well, everything's equal and we both work jobs, etc. And then when you look at women who are working class where most of the men in their demographic that they would date are working physical 
like manual labor jobs are things that are very, very physical. And so there's no, there's no delusion of like physical equality when you're working class because of the fact of how gender segregated work is on the working class level versus in white collar jobs or like blue collar jobs and pink collar jobs are extremely sex segregated versus like white collar jobs, which are still a little bit sex segregated because of scrotes, but like aren't inherently don't inherently need a man or a woman to do them. So like, I feel like on some level, when we're talking about how we best, uh, enact feminism or um, how we best like and get relationships that benefit us. It's like, you have to be honest about when sex differences matter and they do matter, especially if like only one of us can have children. Only one of us is constantly putting ourselves at physical safety risk, dealing with the opposite sex. And then one of us is much stronger than the other one physically. So like, those are things that need to be acknowledged. And then women have to pick out how they're going to make that equitable. And this is what this episode's all about. How do you compensate for the fact that men have serious advantages in some ways that are sex-based? And you can't wave it away by like just saying, oh, make it gender neutral, because if you make it gender neutral or pretend it doesn't exist, then you're going to be in a disadvantage. Yeah, exactly. I love how these double standards go from like, like somewhat inflammatory with mine to fair enough with Ro, then back to super inflammatory with Lilith. <laughs> We're giving you all flavors of ice. We're giving you all flavors of the female supremacist ice cream today, folks. I hope you appreciate it. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. So my most controversial one, I think this is one that actually I made a post about it like a year ago on Reddit and it went crit and like the, both the femisphere, manosphere and like every sphere on Reddit went crazy over this one. I think it's okay for the woman to look at her man's phone to see if he's up to no good. But if a man is monitoring a woman's phone, I think that's course of control. Because here's why. Because everyone's like, oh, if a woman monitors a man's phone, it's just it's course of control, just the same as if a man is doing it to a woman. And I disagree for a few reasons. One, when a man is monitoring a woman's phone, the possibility for that to escalate into physical abuse is much more dangerous. Whereas like, I don't know, maybe a woman could do course of control on a man, but you know, he's not in any physical threat or danger. And there isn't like a whole patriarchal system, you know, under patriarchy, when men monitor a woman, he has more ability to fuck up her life. Whereas like a woman monitoring a man doesn't really have as much of an opportunity to fuck up his life, you know, under patriarchy, just because women have less power than men under patriarchy, right? Secondly, like when men are up to no good, they tend to do like really fucked up shit. Okay. Like when women are up to no good, what is she going to do? Like cheat on him? When a man cheats, I think it's worse than a woman cheats. You know, he could be, I don't know, seeing prostitutes. He could give her an STD. Like because men in general are less trustworthy and their sexuality is more damaging, their behavior needs to be monitored and controlled for their own benefit and for the benefit of society. Whereas when men are controlling a woman, it's like, you know, monitoring her whereabouts, like it could be used for stalking and so on. It could be putting her in physical danger. And I think a woman is entitled to protect herself from a man's infidelity. I don't think a man is entitled to know about the whereabouts of his, you know, his partner, his female partner at all times. I also think that female intuition is a thing. Like the times when I've only snooped once on a guy's phone, but I was justified in doing so because he was being booky behind my back. And I really hate how when women do that and they find something that is that the man's being shady, she sorts, like she ends up being gaslit and told that she was invading his privacy. But it's like, well, no, because if she's found something anyway, then clearly the end justifies the means. She was clearly justified in doing it, if that makes sense. Exactly. When men are monitoring a woman's phone, it's because he wants to control her. It's like mate guarding, isn't it? It's like a sort of mate guarding. It's Or not even just mate guarding. Like, even if she's not cheating at all and she's not even doing anything wrong at all, like, it often escalates. That sort of behavior often does escalate into abuse, like financial abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, and so on, right? When a woman is snooping on a man's phone, it's because she wants to see if he's cheating or if he's, like, you know, violating the relationship, essentially. Like, in both cases, if it's the man monitoring the woman's phone, I consider that a violation of the relationship. If the man is, like, acting sketchy he's also disrespecting the relationship so he's wrong in both cases what do you think bro yeah no it comes down to generally when men want that level of control as far as like snooping on a woman's phone it's a red flag that's among a myriad of other red flags that indicate that this person is dangerous and might kill you where it's more of a psychotic need to control a woman's whereabouts and movements and whereas for women who snoop it's definitely more self-protective It's just like the motivations are completely and totally different. And the end result is completely different. Completely and totally different. Often a woman ends up dead if the man is stalking her. What's the worst that's going to happen if the woman looks at the man's phone? What, she's going to break up with him? Boo fucking who? 
Yeah, find out who's cheating. Yeah, she's going to find out who's cheating and then dump him. Like, boo fucking who? Like, the end result is nowhere near the same. And the motivations are not the same. That's why I think that's an acceptable double standard. And then also, because of the way that law enforcement works, we did our um, episode on Jennifer's. Law enforcement often tacitly helps men stalk women and like prevents women from maintaining some kind of anonymity when they need to leave an abusive situation. Most of the time when women are trying to snoop through a phone or snoop through uh, anything to get evidence, it's a way to prove abuse right? It's quite different. Like a lot of times it's proving abuse. A lot of it's proving coercion. Yeah. Try to disprove the gaslighting and generally, once again, a self-protective mechanism and less about trying to like control a man's every movement. Women don't have the ability to control a man's every movement the same way that men do or like the same way that men attempt to do. Exactly. Versus like when men do it, and I'm not saying that like women don't cheat or anything like that, but at the same time, it's like men who are demanding access without any type of prior suspicion or anything that's even like remotely suggests that he should be suspicious are insane and controlling and they're all dangerous. Whereas I don't think women who do, who snoop are dangerous. Yeah, exactly. So that's the double standard that I support that everyone always disagrees with me on that one, but I uh, stand by what I said and I'll never apologize for it. So similarly to the paying for dates one, I think it's perfectly acceptable for a man to fund a woman's lifestyle. And I think that's something that men should strive to do for the woman in their life. But I don't think a woman should have to do the same in terms of financial labor. Being with a man is generally detrimental to a woman, especially if they have kids. So, you know, if we look at the sexual market, generally speaking, women are generally in a lot more demand than men. I mean, so this means if a woman chooses to be with a guy, she is shutting off a lot of potential other opportunities that she might have that might actually be better than the man she's chosen to be with. Uh, Secondly speaking, if a woman has has a child and a lot of women have found this out the hard way 50 50 doesn't cut it because you can't go 50 50 on childbirth and even child rearing as the covid pandemic has shown and even when both parents are in the home it's still not 50 50 it's still the woman doing all of it so therefore you know the man basically funding the woman's lifestyle should be the bare minimum and it also acts as a counterweight to the disadvantages that women face by being in a monogamous relationship with a man and having his kids if she chooses to do that This is an odd double standard, too, because I know a lot of the feminists are like, well, a man should step up and he should be able to be a second parent. And like, we all definitely agree with that. Unfortunately, society right now doesn't have the infrastructure to teach men that. And that's why women are constantly frustrated with their partners, because like it's one of two things. Either we could try to teach them and pre-vet and do our best to try to weed out all of the men who won't be good parents, which we absolutely agree with. Or you spend most of the time with a guy who's just on some level and maybe on a primal level just is never going to be as instinctual about how to care for a child as a woman is you know depending on whether you buy into certain aspects of evolutionary biology there might be certain things that women are more instinctually able to do because of the way that we evolved as the female caretakers of the species that may be harder for men to instinctively learn like obviously they can learn to cook and clean and shit like that that has nothing to be gendered but just like as far as like regular child care Or you think that they're being lazy and actually weaponizing their incompetence. And then you have to spend the relationship trying to like get them up to the level that you're at. This is like a constant source of frustration for women because men are constantly behind us on this particular thing. So I think like if they cannot perform to that level, it's okay to have a double standard because they're slacking compared to where you're at. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's the reason why I wouldn't date a man who earns less than I do. Because, again, this might sound judgmental, but I don't really... I also, just as an aside, I don't understand why when women are dating, they are afraid to be judgmental. Like, if you're gonna be discriminatory in quotation marks and judgmental, this should be the most acceptable arena to do it in because your choice of life partner is arguably the biggest choice, especially for a woman that she can make because making the wrong choice that you could literally wind up dead so i don't really understand this logic about am i being too harsh am i being too judgmental i'm like no judge away anyway going back to what i was saying this is why i wouldn't date a guy who makes like less money than i do now in the uk i am going to admit that is 
pretty hard to find not gonna like give away my salary but it's a standard that I'm gonna stick to because I'm not sure if I'll have kids one day but if I eventually have kids I don't want to be worrying that our quality of life is gonna drop you know massively because you know there is a 20k income gap between me and my husband or that I'll have to go back to work earlier than planned because he can't afford to pay for the household whilst I'm off work and just generally I just like Again, I know it sort of goes back to like the disadvantage and advantage thing, but I sort of feel like, and the, and again, this might sound a bit, a bit left, but it's like, if I've managed to do quite well as somebody, as a black woman from a poor minority in the UK, then men literally don't have an excuse as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, what's their excuse? No, I agree. I'm so turned off by male laziness. I, it's just like the thing that makes my vagina shrivel up more than anything else is that if I feel like me... If I can do better than you and I'm female, then I feel like you're slacking, right? Like you haven't tried nearly as hard as I have in life. Like you're not focused. Yeah. And I don't find that attractive. A lot of this just has to do with like, so maybe this is like my immigrant work ethic as well that I'm trying to uh, balance. (laughs) But like, yeah, I feel like a man, if he doesn't have any like dependence or anything like that, then if he spends most of his, like he should basically be able to fail up into a certain level of success, right? Just by like virtue of being able to negotiate better with salary, you know, as long as they like, their universities are practically begging to make the genders more equitable because men aren't qualifying at nearly the same rates as women are. You know what I'm saying? Like there's, and there's certain niche professions where, especially among minority men, like they're really, really looking to support men in that profession. Right. So I feel like a lot of times if a man is not able to find his way, it's a little bit more deliberate. Like it's like they're spent way too much time navel gazing and not enough time working. And that's a turnoff. And there are some attributes as well, just off the back of what Rose said, things like ambition, things like drive, things like determination that you can't teach somebody. I think it's very much a case of you have to develop it or you'll never develop it. Like there are some, like even like being clean, like if you must, you can teach a guy how to be tidier. Do you know what I mean? But you can't teach these innate, I guess, like traits that, and I'm just not going to waste my time with, you know, with a guy like that. Like personally, that's just my absolute cut off. If he's doing worse than me, especially if he's older than me as well. Like I've always dated guys who are several years older than me. There's no fucking excuse. I'm sorry. Like I'm not doing that. Yeah. It starts to feel like they weren't focused enough, in which case like you can't rely on them. Not even like your standard of living would drop. It's that your quality of life would drop because that guy would not work as hard to maintain it. Or he wouldn't be as like motivated to, you know, create a way out of no way. A person who's like, who has uh, resilience and the ability to be creative in the way that they solve problems. Like, I just feel like a person like that, like the days of the man, like going to the, his like uh, shoe salesman job and then coming home and drinking a beer and putting his hand in his pants, like that shit's over. Like the old Al Bundy trope from like, if you ever watch like old, um, old TV, like that kind of thing is it used to be able, once again, like men could kind of fail up into those jobs. And it used to be that like, you can make a good middle class income and those type of things. But like nowadays, I think it requires a little bit more hustle. And so the guys that aren't putting in the hustle are actually, it's not just your quality of life is going to drop or that like, they might not be an asset It's like they might actually be a liability. And it's not necessarily fair because the economy sucks, but it is what it is right now. <laughs> Exactly. And it's like, don't also forget the axes that they will eventually begin to resent you. Like a lot of men say that they want a woman who can hold her own, but when they're actually confronted with such a woman, a lot of them don't know how to act. And, you know, I've experienced it myself where um, the men I've been dating, they know I can do better than them and I'm actively doing better than them. It's not like it's just a theory, but for example, when I was with my first boyfriend and I was applying to uni and getting accepted, he just started getting really nasty and saying, I was too stupid to go. They're not going to accept you anyway. And this was a guy who hadn't, for various reasons, like finished even the equivalent of his high school education. So he was clearly projecting his failures onto me. But it's like a lot of men say they want an independently successful woman, but I don't know how many of them can legitimately handle and be supportive. And when I say supportive, I don't mean saying, yeah, go girl, you know, I support you. I mean, is a guy willing to sacrifice as in move house, possibly change his job, careers uh, for the advancement of the woman's career? I don't think there are many men who are willing to do that. 
And the women that have been, like the married women I know who are very successful, their husbands were willing to do that. So there was one, I worked with a woman, she was the boss of her husband in the same organisation. People did say it was awkward with them in meetings, but it just goes to show like there are some men out there who'll be okay with that, but I, I would guess the vast majority, they would feel somehow about their wife being their boss and earning double, and then basically earning, you know, double what they're earning, especially within the same company in the same industry. I don't think many guys will be okay with that. So should I go next? Sure. Okay. My other double standard, under no circumstances, under no circumstances, should a woman get down on her knees and ask a man to marry her. Agree. I don't know why this is controversial. Agreed. Agreed. Embarrassing. Stand up, sis. Don't ever in your life do that. Uh... Don't ever in your life do that. I've seen there was like like a meme and a trend for a while of people posting videos where the woman proposed to the man and like trying to play it off as romantic. And then you'd always hear the backstory and it'd be like, well, they've been together for 10 years. It's usually some forever girlfriend who is trying to set up a high pressure situation to force this guy to marry her on the spot. There is so many more benefits to marriage for men than for women that nowhere in your life should you be humbling yourself so that you can beg a man to be attached to you. That's crazy talk. It's so embarrassing. So embarrassing. Secondhand embarrassment to any woman who gets down on her knees and tries to propose to a man because he is not that committed to you. He's probably using you for a free pussy subscription if he hasn't yet made effort to make you his wife. It's like a a marriage of convenience. And he's going to be the same lazy, non-committal scrote your entire marriage and relationship. And with men, he'll more than likely upgrade to somebody he actually wants if you ever should meet that person. So it's just like, it's embarrassing all around. Like, I know, like, once again, a lot of the feminist people are like, a woman could post to a man and they're stupid and they should shut up because like, they're, (laughs) once again, they're going to get exploited and grifted by men who are going to use them for their own personal gain. It's like, with all these like things that are gender neutral, they sound nice, but you really got to do the cost benefit analysis before you go all in. There are some times where gender neutrality benefits women. And there's some times where it is a massive liability to us. And like, this is one of those times, actually, pretty much everything we've described in this episode are things that a much higher risk and a much bigger liability to women if we pretend there are no sex differences in this area. Because once again, I'm not going to mention this person's name, but there's a song called like, Half on a Baby. You actually can't go half on a baby. It's like 100% done by women. Yeah, you can't go 50-50 on childbirth. You can't go 50-50 on breastfeeding. You're going to do all the labor. You're going to do all the childcare labor, or at least most of it, until like there's some kind of vast, massive improvement in men's parenting skills. And also you're probably going to be the person that's going to have to take the pay cut if you need to stay home and take care of your children for any reason. Not even if you want to be a stay at home mom. Say you just have a kid that has special needs or like gets sick or something like that. It's more than likely going to be you. Did you ever notice how in all of these videos where the woman proposes to the man, the man always looks so uncomfortable? Right. Like the look on the man's fucking face is like, he's always kind of like, oh, is this a prank? Like, (laughs) it's like, Deer in a headlight. Oh, yeah, deer in a headlight, or he just looks uncomfortable. He thinks it's a joke. Like, and when he realizes that she's serious, he's he like has this face like, oh shit, like you know. So you know, there's always a picture of them after, and she's like, oh my god, he said yes, I'm so happy, and you can see the like cringe in his face. I'm like, girl, like why would you embarrass yourself, and humiliate yourself for a man like this who doesn't even care about you that much? It's so embarrassing. If you're a content creator, don't even do it for the likes. Don't even do it as a joke. Don't even do it as a prank. Because there's been even like content creators that try to do it as a prank. And you can just see, I was like, oh, this is the beginning of the end of that relationship. Because like she, (laughs) he reacted in a way she wasn't predicting, right? Because she's like, oh, I'm going to do this as a prank. And then you can see the tension behind it. It's like, don't even waste your time. I think, you know, you bring up marriage, you talk about marriage with men, but under no circumstances should you be the person that proposes it exactly i agree 1000 percent. it's so embarrassing i would literally rather eat glass than ask a man to marry me as a woman just like as everything has been said like knowing what women go through when they're married and the stuff that they usually end up having to give up i could just never ask my way into that yeah like knowing how much women suffer and how much men benefit from marriage no woman should ever be begging for that ever it's the man who should be begging for that it's just like begging for your own imprisonment and disadvantage, let's be real, if, if, um, for a lot of women. There are some women who marry great guys and, you know, they improve over time, but that's not the norm at the moment anyway. 
It's like they're begging for validation. And if you're begging for validation from men, you're a pick me. (laughs) It's okay. We've all had pick me tendencies. Just admit it. Especially the wrong type of men as well. Right. Just admit that you're kind of a pick me and that you have to work on your self-esteem. You know, because if he's in a relationship and he's not making you secure like you have a future and you have to guess by high pressuring him into a marriage. Oh, yeah. It's beyond beneath you. I don't think there's a single woman in existence for whom that's beneath for whom that's not beneath. I should say. Should I go next? I do have a line in here. We already touched on this, but I wanted to summarize. I have a line here saying a woman's wallet belongs to hers alone. A man's wallet belongs to the community. So that's like a Russian saying. That's a Russian culture thing. I completely agree. Like Russia is a highly patriarchal culture. This is one area that I completely agree. Yeah. A man's wallet belongs to the group. The woman's wallet belongs to her alone. Yeah. A man's wallet is the community wallet versus a woman's wallet. A woman's money is her money. And we just did a joint finances episode on the Patreon that was bonus content because of an article where they were trying to make the argument that like, oh, couples who pull their money together are more likely to stay together. But they don't really drill down to see like why that is. And it's because if men have all the control of the money, then they tend to use it to be tyrannical towards everybody. Whereas like women are more likely to understand the material needs of everybody in the tribe, so to speak, and use the money to support the material needs for it healthy group cohesion. And it's like a completely different way that men versus women spend money. Yes, there are women who are like retail queens and maybe spend too much on shopping, etc. But like for the vast majority of relationships, because women are more likely to be caretakers, not just of their children, but of their extended family, then they're more likely ears on the ground understanding what everybody needs and how to manage a functional household versus like men who like want to spend it on toys and gambling and probably extracurricular activities you wouldn't be happy with like porn, right? So like it is very important that you know what his paycheck is and that it gets distributed to the family and everybody who your family unit is responsible for caring for. Versus like for women, you should have some kind of money stashed away somewhere if you need to escape because that once again, that's like your break glass in case of emergency money. And it doesn't necessarily mean that all of your money should be going to him because at the end again, like, first of all, what does he fucking need it for? Like, (laughs) exactly. What are you doing paying for your man? That's fucking embarrassing. God. Yeah, because it's like, once again, if he can't keep up with the demands of supporting your lifestyle, then if anything happens to you or you have to do a caretaking role, which more than likely falls on women, then he can't support it. Then he's useless then. Like it used to be a time where like men felt bad if they didn't have a job and they were dependent on everybody. And we need to go back to that because like it's gone from like, okay, it's okay for a man if he's not working or like we shouldn't put so much pressure on a man to be a provider that like they want to kill themselves or something like that. Because there's, you know, there's men that like feel like, well, I failed as a man and I want to be embarrassed and it's, it becomes like very toxic masculinity. But like, once again, it's turned into this like generation of freeloading losers. And like, that's just not acceptable. Like if they took full advantage of the idea that they don't have to be providers anymore. And to the point where like now they're just freeloading leeches on a lot of the women in their family. And a lot of the women in a lot of families enable that shit. There's a lot of these like stay at home sons, right? That just fail their launch. And all they do is like, you know, sit in their mom's basement and play video games and consume and do all those types of things. And they have not learned to either. They've not learned a tangible skill that's going to make them money, uh, give them the ability to provide in the real world. And they have no like caretaking skills. They don't even even ha- know how to be a Mr. Mom or a stay-at-home dad if you were to be the breadwinning mom. So it's like they've literally made themselves useless because not only are they not looking at themselves as responsible for trying to provide anything. They don't want to fill the masculine role, but they don't want to fill the feminine role either. They just don't want to do anything. Exactly. They're not doing shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they're useless. So what's the point? Like, what's the point of you being there? You're literally useless. And this is sort of why I feel like men have just made they're starting to make themselves irrelevant over time. And just like, especially the ones who are refusing to do things like paying for dates, making sure their partner is, is financially secure. Because it's like, if you're not going to do that and you're not going to do the child rearing or the feminine, in quotation mark, um, activities, then literally what is the point of having you around? I mean, a lot of them are not even good for sex either. So it's like, literally, what is the point of having you around? There's no reason. Demand sex and so they can feel like the Kang. So they can feel important. Yeah. <laughs> my masculinity (laughs) and then they can talk about how all the women in the house are feminizing them oh my god when we do our episode on like church growths we should talk about this about how like men will act completely useless and then blame women and say they're being feminized by women it's like we're feminizing you 
Like we didn't tell your ass. You're feminizing yourself because they're not even doing anything, any of the actual valuable labor that women normally do. They're not even being feminized. They're just being demasculinized. They're just being infantilized. They're just being negated. They're nothing. (laughs) Yeah, they're being negated because most of what you're doing is useless and stupid. So you're not being feminized. Like no one's going to force you into a feminine role unless like you choose that because you're too lazy and competent and want to fight with women rather than like creating something of value in the world, right? Like you feminize yourself. But that's the thing. They're not even in the feminine role. Like they're just in these, like the underclass male role. That's true. I don't want to insult women by calling these like useless man children feminized because that's like... That's an insult to women's labor. Yeah. What they're calling useless infantilization of men is what they're calling feminization. But I'm like, no, it's just you being useless and infantile. You're not being feminized, right? Like you, that's you. Yeah, they're just being juvenile. If you were feminized, you'd be a lot more attractive to be blunt. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like they'd be working on their appearance, trying to be sexually attractive to women so they could get taken care of. And they're not doing any of that shit. You know, guys get mad at me on Twitter all the time when I say things like, you know, men should work, men should contribute to their community. They always come up with like, in exchange for what? Why should I have to do this? Like, why should I contribute to my community if I don't get anything in return kind of thing? And it's like, what you get in return is that we allow you to exist within our society, right? Like men don't seem to understand that like, being part of a community or being a member of society has inherent benefits, right? You know, they have this like taking, take, take, take attitude. They just, they don't want to have to contribute to their community unless they get something in return. But even though they, they already get returns, but they just don't value those returns. Like they don't see those as valuable, right? They don't see human connection as valuable. Yeah. And then they wonder why they're depressed all of the time. And then they get into the red pill and they get into like this extreme. Yeah. Why are they depressed? Why are they lonely? Why does no one want to talk to them? Yeah, they get into this like extreme right wing conservative and that everything else is like everything else is conspiring against them. Right. And they're like their development. Yeah. And it's really just their own failures. It's usually like them not able to form healthy attachments to women because they want to dominate women or exploit women or feel entitled for women to doing labor for them. And I'm like, you got to get off your ass and make your own way. Like, and that's on you. Like, it's not everybody has to do that. It's not like it's just men, actually. Like a lot of times women do as well. Like even women who are gold diggers, it's not like they're sitting on their ass waiting for a man to rescue them. Like they got to put in work to become attractive to men, to be, quote, chosen to be like, you know, a trophy wife or something like that. So once again, these guys aren't feminized because they're not even doing anything that would make them attractive to the opposite sex to get chosen. So stupid. (laughs) I haven't seen any of these guys becoming pick me's like, (laughs) in fact, like they look at the guys who attempt to pander to the women, they call them simps and stuff, right? They're like, they're not being feminized. But yeah, so that's our, unless anyone has any final ones to add. Oh, yeah, yeah. I always take the woman's side in a disagreement, even if she is wrong, because society is always so quick to side with the man in every conflict. And, you know, it's, people are so quick to like gaslight women and be like, oh, are you sure he meant it that way? Or, oh, are you sure you're not overreacting or yada, yada, yada kind of thing? In every conflict ever, I always take the woman's side, no matter what. And actually, it's made me an even better leader. So I think that's another, (laughs) like, (laughs) I think like pandering to men is actually like bad for you, right? Like, it's actually better to prioritize women. Like, I'm actually better at my job because of that. I think there is something in not because even amongst other women, when a woman like steps out of line, she's instantly cancelled, but they don't usually have the same energy for men. And I do think that one of the strongest pillars of patriarchy is the lack of female class solidarity. And this whole idea that a woman like has to be perfect, even though, you know, that level of perfection is absolutely never achieved because they keep shifting the goalposts but this idea that a woman has to be perfect before she's even you know worthy of a scrap of sympathy is just bollocks like you know when it comes to men they don't even have to like or care about the guy they're defending before they defend him they will just defend him because he's male or they'll start making excuses for him because he's male like women you know we need to start doing the same thing and stop trying to get cheap brownie points from men by trying to be like i'm not like those nasty feminists who are pro-woman like being pro-woman is not an insult you shouldn't see that as a derogatory term like you are you know as a female why wouldn't you be pro your own pro your own sex it's just like me getting offended if somebody said i'm pro black i was like well yeah of course because i'm black like would you expect me to be like pro white like don't take it as an insult 
insult, but people try and use it as an insult to basically bully you into going against the interests of your sex class and by proxy going against the interests of yourself. Because ultimately when these men want to discriminate against women and, you know, hang and lynch them digitally or in public in whatever form they do it, they're not going to remember that you were one of the good feminists. They're just going to see you as a woman and act and treat you accordingly. Yeah, stop seeding ground. (laughs) This is a fight, ladies. Yeah. You have to take the high ground no matter what. And what I mean like by the high ground, not the moral high ground, I mean the tactical high ground. Yeah, you have to take the tactical high ground, not the moral high ground. I love you, Ro. That was such a good line. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. You're going to figure out where the high ground is, where the most advantageous position for you to be is and get your ass there, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not just that. You got to get the high ground and you got to keep the high ground, okay? And you got to like shoot anyone who tries to take the high ground from you. <laughs> exactly. That's the thing. And this is like, it became the most apparent to me during Me Too when women would talk about any type of stories that would be clearly sexual assault. Men would try to make it seem like it was gray and she was responsible. They are always going to look, they're always going to take the high ground where women are responsible tactical high ground, even when it's very clear cut cases of coercion and rape, they're going to take the tactical high ground that women are responsible, even when it's very clear that's not the case. And I realized like, oh, it's a reflexive thing for them. It's always reflexive that they're always going to create the narrative from whatever situation that is absolves them from responsibility and makes you responsible. So in order to stop seeding ground, you have to like create, you have to have almost like the same level of knee jerk audacity to defend yourself and defend your sex. And other members in your group, right? I think it is rational to like, if you're a member of an oppressed group, it is rational to prioritize yourself and other members of that oppressed group, right? Like I see a lot of black women supremacists on Twitter and I think that is rational. Like black women should be black women supremacists. I think like women should be women supremacists, right? Men are already male supremacists, like by default. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, they're default male supremacists. Like, they're already going to put themselves first. You can't be a woman and be a a male supremacist. That's just fucking dumb and self-defeating, right? Yeah, that's the end of our show. Let us know about if you have any double standards between men and women. We'd love to hear them. Yeah, so we don't apologize for not one thing that was said during this podcast. I'm just going (laughs) to... Gonna go ahead and put that out there. Not at all. Yeah, I do not apologize for my double standards against men. I'm saying it with my chest. In fact, I don't even call it double standards. I just call it a form of social positive action, which is long overdue. Yeah, for women. So yeah, that's our show. Check out our website at thefemaledatingstrategy.com. You can go to our forum if you want to discuss this episode, as well as sign up for our Patreon if you'd like to support us, as well as submit a question to us to answer on air or submit a story like a rest of show story that we can read on air. Or if you want to talk to us in our Discord about future episodes, uh, participate in our war room. That's all on our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash thefemaledatingstrategy. Follow us on Twitter at femdatstrat. Follow us on Instagram at underscore the female dating strategy and sign up for our newly launched newsletter. Uh, So you can sign up for a newsletter and that's it. That's the spiel. So thanks for listening, Queens. And for all you lurking, but what about equality scrotes out there? Die mad. See y'all next week.